Lyra is a small constellation and one of the easiest to find in the northern celestial hemisphere. Its peak visibility is during the summer months, especially from June through September. Its brightest star, Vega, shines as the fifth brightest star in the entire night sky, and it's the brightest star of the famous summer triangle asterism, along with the stars Deneb and Altair. Even though Lyra only contains a handful of stars, it's home to a famous object called the Ring Nebula. In this video, we will explore how to find Lyra, the bright stars and celestial objects within its boundaries, and the mythologies connected to this star pattern. Lyra is one of the oldest recognized constellations in the sky. Its name comes from the Latin word Lyra, meaning lyre, a small harp, and it's often associated with the Greek myth of Orpheus, the legendary musician whose music had charmed the gods. This constellation was recorded in the 2nd century by the astronomer Ptolemy as one of his original 48 constellations. Today, Lyra is best known for its brilliant star Vega, a blue-white beacon just 26 light-years away and one of the brightest stars visible in the night sky. To find Lyra, start by spotting Vega, the brightest star in the east after sunset during the summer months in the northern hemisphere, or winter for our friends in the southern hemisphere. From Vega, look for a small parallelogram of stars. That's the body of the harp. Lyra also sits near Cygnus the Swan and Hercules, and this makes it a useful pattern when looking in this area of the sky. In my location, Vega is a zenith star, which means it passes directly overhead as the night progresses. Now let's take a closer look at the shape that Lyra forms in the sky. On this star map, the first thing you'll likely notice is the large dot in the center. That's Vega, which can also be pronounced as Vega. And it's the brightest star in Lyra, and that's why it's so large on the star map. Lyra is nestled between two larger constellations, Hercules on one side and Cygnus on the other. Despite its smaller size, Lyra stands out, mainly because Vega is so bright and easy to spot. Lyra is one of those go-to constellations when navigating the stars. Vega acts as an anchor point because it can direct you to other constellations and bright stars around it. Lyra is also part of the well-known summer triangle asterism, and that's made up of three bright stars, Vega, Deneb, and Altair. Together, they form a noticeable triangle in the night sky, one that's even visible from areas with significant light pollution. Vega is the brightest of the three. Look for Cygnus, the cross-shaped swan flying down the Milky Way, and Aquila, the eagle, with its bright eye called Altair that soars nearby. Now let's get some practice identifying Lyra and the constellations around it. When you first look at this image, notice the large, obvious triangle shape formed by the three brightest stars. This is known as the summer triangle, and it's one of the easiest patterns to spot in the night sky. Start by finding the brightest star. That's Vega, and just below it, look for the small parallelogram shape, and this marks the outline of Lyra. Next, move to the second brightest star in the triangle. This is Altair, and it belongs to the constellation Aquila the Eagle. Finally, the third point of the triangle is Deneb. It's the dimmest of the three, but don't let that fool you. Deneb is actually the largest and most distant of the trio, and since it's further away than the other two stars, it just appears a bit dimmer. I do have separate detailed videos about Vega, Altair, and Deneb, so if you'd like to dive deeper into each of these stars, check out the links in the description below. Here's another great image we can use to practice identifying Lyra and some of the surrounding constellations. This is a wide field view of the summer night sky in the northern hemisphere, and there's a lot going on here, so let's start with the most obvious patterns. First, on the left side of the photo, look for the summer triangle. Start with Vega, the brightest point of the triangle, and then find that parallelogram shape just below it. Hopefully you're starting to recognize this pattern. Next, look for Cygnus the Swan. It's a cross-shaped pattern that stretches right through the glow of the Milky Way, which makes it relatively easy to spot. Then find Altair, the star on the lower right corner of the summer triangle. It belongs to the constellation Aquila the Eagle. And Aquila's overall shape can be trickier to trace, but Altair gives you a strong starting point. Now, towards the right side of the photo, you'll see a dense star field, and this is the Milky Way's core. There are two major constellations that stand out, Scorpius with its curved tail and bright red star Antares, and Sagittarius, which often appears as a teapot-shaped asterism. There are many other fainter constellations in this image, but for now, focus on the main patterns. Lyra, Cygnus, Aquila, Scorpius, and Sagittarius. Now let's examine some of Lyra's brightest stars and objects. First is Vega. 
And this is the fifth brightest star in the night sky, and it's a bluish-white star located just 26 light years away. Vega was the North Star about 12,000 years ago, and will be again around the year 13,727 due to the Earth's axial precession. Just next to Vega, you'll find Epsilon Lyrae, better known as the Double Double. At first glance, it looks like a single star, but even with a modest pair of binoculars, you can see it split into two stars. But here's the fun part. Through a telescope at higher magnification, each of these two stars split again, revealing a total of four stars, two tight binary systems orbiting each other. That's why it's called the Double Double. You'll need about 100 times magnification or more to clearly separate both pairs, and this does depend upon your sky conditions and equipment. It's one of those classic objects that amateur astronomers just love to see. In terms of celestial objects, Messier 57, also called the Ring Nebula, is one of the best-known planetary nebulae in the sky. Its ghostly ring is this glowing shell of a dying star, and it's what our own sun might look like in billions of years. And when you hear the word planetary nebula, you might expect that it might have something to do with planets, but it doesn't. The name comes from early astronomers who thought these round glowing objects look like distant planets through their telescopes. In reality, a planetary nebula is the glowing shell of gas and dust that's being expelled by a dying star. And here's how this works. Stars like our sun spend most of their lives fusing hydrogen into helium in their cores. As the star runs out of hydrogen fuel, it swells into a red giant and it begins to lose its outer layers. Over thousands of years, these layers drift off into space, and what's left behind is the hot, dense core of the star, which is now called a white dwarf. It gives off intense ultraviolet radiation, and that makes the surrounding gas around it glow, and it often creates a spherical, cloud-like structure. These structures don't last long, just 10 to 20,000 years before eventually the gas dissipates and they fade into space. The Ring Nebula is a classic example of this final stage of a dying star, and it really is a beautiful glimpse into the final breath of a star like our sun. Messier 56 is a globular star cluster located in the constellation of Lyra. It lies around 32,000 light years away from Earth, and it contains hundreds of thousands of old stars tightly bound by gravity. While it's not as bright as some other globular clusters, it can still be spotted with a pair of binoculars or a telescope. Let's take a closer look at some of the myths tied to this constellation. It's important to remember, there's no single correct version of a constellation story. Star legends vary across cultures and time periods, each offering a different lens through which to view the night sky. As with many constellations, Lyra has a rich variety of stories behind it. Its earliest known form comes from ancient Middle Eastern civilizations, who saw these stars not as a harp, but as a vulture. In fact, Vega, the brightest star of Lyra, comes from the Arabic word for vulture. In a later time period, the ancient Greeks reimagined Lyra as a harp or a lyre. And while that may not seem like the most thrilling object to immortalize the stars, the legend behind it is one of love and grief. And this is the story of Orpheus and Eurydice. Orpheus was a gifted musician and poet whose music could enchant animals, humans, and even the gods themselves. On the day he married Eurydice, he played his lyre for her in celebration. As she danced through the meadow, Eurydice stepped into a nest of vipers, was bitten on the heel, and died. Heartbroken, Orpheus poured his sorrow into his song. His music was so moving that it stirred the gods and the nymphs who urged him to journey to the underworld to bring her back. And there he played his lyre once again, this time for Hades and Persephone, the rulers of the underworld. So powerful was his music that even they were softened, and they agreed to let Eurydice return to the world of the living. But there was one condition. Orpheus must not look back at her until they had both reached the surface. So he led her through the shadows, but just before they emerged into the light, doubt overcame him. Was she really there? Had he been tricked? He turned, and in that moment, Eurydice vanished, pulled back into the underworld forever. Orpheus was devastated. He never recovered from the lost and refused the love of others. Eventually, he was killed by a group of Mynads, who were followers of Dionysus, after he spurned their advances and remained loyal to Eurydice. In the end, Orpheus and Eurydice reunited in death. Moved by their tragic love, Zeus placed the harp of Orpheus among the stars, where it became the constellation Lyra, a reminder of beauty, love, and loss. Just like Lyra tells a Greek tale of love and heartbreak, 
the stars also hold stories of love and separation in Chinese and Japanese traditions. These stories involve the stars Vega, Altair, and the Milky Way, and these legends mirror the tale of Orpheus and Eurydice in their own way. In the Chinese story, which predates the Greek legend by over 2,000 years, we meet the weaver girl and the humble cowherd. And in this story, they fall in love, but their relationship was forbidden by the gods. The Queen Mother of the West created a river in the sky, the Silver River, which was the Milky Way, and it was meant to keep them apart. Moved by their devotion, a flock of magpies forms a bridge once a year, allowing them to meet on the Qi Shi Festival, which is held on the seventh day of the seventh lunar month. Centuries later, the story reached Japan, where it was adapted into the tale of Orihime and Hikobashi. In this version, Orihime was a heavenly seamstress, and Hikobashi a cowherder who lived across the Milky Way. Their love caused them to neglect their duties, so the gods separated them, allowing them to meet once a year on the Tanabata, Japan's star festival. If it rains on that day, the magpie bridge cannot form, and the lovers must wait another year. That's why people in both cultures still wish for clear skies on this special night. In the night sky, Altair lies opposite of Vega, with the Milky Way flowing between them, just like in the legends. The Chinese legend of the weaver girl and cowherd is one of the oldest known myths associated with Vega, predating both Greek and Japanese interpretations. The stories of the stars often connect us to the past, helping us understand how different cultures made sense of the night sky, and remarkably, many of these legends still endure today. It is important to note that star legends have evolved over time and across cultures, there is no one single true story for any constellations. There's just a variety of them. We've come to the end of our video about Lyra, so let's review everything we've learned so far. It's a small but distinctive constellation and one of the easiest to find in the Northern Hemisphere. Its peak visibility is during the summer months from June to September. The best way to spot Lyra is first finding the Summer Triangle Asterism where Vega, the fifth brightest star in the entire night sky, marks the brightest point. Despite its size, Lyra is home to fascinating celestial sites, including the Ring Nebula and the globular cluster Messier 56, and both are rewarding targets for both binoculars or telescope users. So whether you're zooming out to see the big picture or focusing in on the finer details, Lyra is both a beautiful and useful pattern to know in the night sky, so let me know in the comments below, what about Lyra fascinates you? Do you like the target seen through the telescope or maybe it's those enduring legends of this pattern? For me, it's both of those reasons and just the simple fact that it's an easy constellation to find and it's kind of like that anchor star pattern when trying to find everything else around it. So as you look up and trace Lyra's tiny little harp pattern in the sky, Imagine these ancient legends that are tied to these stars, and they're nice reminders that the constellations just aren't patterns of light, but living stories that have been passed down through generations. Thanks so much for watching.